Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Tonight we're looking at verse 176, which reads as follows. Ekang dhammang atitasa musa vadisa chantuno vitimna paralokasa nati papang akaryang which means for one who transgresses one dhamma, one thing, the person who speaks falsely this one thing, vitina paralokasa, one who has discarded the afterlife, thrown, thrown away their afterlife. Nati papangakaryang, there is no evil they won't do. There is no evil that will not be done for su by such a person. <clears throat> Some weighty words. So the Buddha told this verse in response to, and I keep saying this, but this is one of the more famous stories in Buddhist, uh, I guess they're all pretty well known, but this one especially I think is one of the more well known in Asian culture, in, in Asian Buddhist culture. Probably not so much in the West. We don't know a lot of the stories, which is a shame. Well, we're trying to remedy that partly in this series. How the story goes, the, as it's been passed down, that the Buddha was spreading his teachings throughout the area in, in, in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, that area of the world. And, and his virtues were being spread and he was being, becoming quite famous. And he was honored by kings and rich people alike, and and so he, his his teaching was flourishing. I mean, because of just how great it was. I don't think there should be any doubt that that was the case, considering how great his teaching is. I mean, for most of the people who have been watching these videos since the beginning. Uh, it's quite clear that there's some greatness to the Buddhist teaching for people who have practiced the meditation in this tradition. They can easily agree that no, it's, there's, there's, it's no wonder that Buddhism is such a powerful force in the world, even in the midst of a lot of other powerful forces. And speaking of powerful forces, uh, even in India, it wasn't, they weren't all Buddhists. In fact, of course, when the Buddha arose, there were, there were already religious traditions and religious teachers present. And they weren't very happy about the Buddha's fame. They became quite disturbed by it. So the text says they would gather in the street and uh, chastise people for being so taken by the Buddha, saying, is the monk Gotama the only Buddha? We also are Buddhas. Does that alone which is given to him yield abundant fruit? That which is given to us returns abundant fruit. So this was, this was important for people. They, they supported religious people and there was a tradition of supporting the religion that you believed would um, bear fruit. You know, for a lot of people, they're not thinking about becoming enlightened. They just want a better life. And there was a belief, and still is a belief, that I think is in some ways well-founded. In some ways it's embellished, I think, by, peop by religious people, that, that if you give to a religious person, there's some good karma that comes from it, right? There's, you get benefits back. Now we certainly 
And the Buddha certainly affirmed that sort of a thing. And I'll talk a little bit more. I think it's actually an interesting lesson. But I think it, we have to be careful not to embellish this idea. Anyway, this was um, people's thinking. And these monks were like, well, give to us. Give, you know, support us. Give us all, all these monasteries and food and robes. We're Buddhas as well, I would say. But it didn't work, of course, because their teachings... I mean, this is the thing, not all teachings... It should go without saying, and it shouldn't need to be, shouldn't need to be said, that not all teachings are, are alike. Anyone who says that all religions are, are alike or teach the same thing, it's... I've said this before, it's a nice thought, and it certainly is useful, practical, in when you're living amongst... when you're living in a multicultural, multi-religious society. Otherwise, you just fight. But it's not really true. Right? I mean, it's true that there are teachings out there that are kind of bizarre. And, and there are meditation teachings that certainly don't lead to great things. You know, there are others that lead to great things, but not to the greatest thing. So it's not even fair to say that all meditation teachings are the same, all spiritual paths lead to the same goal, it's not really true. There are many goals and there are practices that don't even lead to the goals that they say. So we will claim that the Buddha's teaching is that which leads to the highest goal. And all these other teachings, they might do good, they might be good, but they don't lead to the ultimate goal. Anyway, at the time there was a woman who was ordained in one of these traditions, which is neat. I mean, even, even outside of Buddhism at the time, it wasn't that women weren't allowed or were, weren't found practicing the spiritual life. Even outside of the Buddhist teaching, it seems there were women, rare, I guess, but there were women who uh, undertook to practice spirituality. I mean, that shouldn't be a surprise. It's kind of it's kind of, we, we, we make Indian society out to be, ancient Indian society out to be very uh, anti-woman or, or you know, what's the patriarchal or whatever, sexist. Yeah. And I think there's definitely something to that. I don't think even the Buddha was, was free from that sort of thinking simply because of you know, cultural... The, culture, the nature of the culture, but uh, anyway, there, there, it's not to say, I mean, women certainly were not in any way less interested in, in enlightenment, we can say that for sure. So this woman, unfortunately, found her way into the wrong group. We can say with some certainty it was the wrong group, even if you think some of these other groups had their heads on straight. This group certainly didn't. They were very jealous. And so one day they, they thought, ah, well, she'll help us. Well, we'll get her to find a way to cast reproach upon the monk Gotama. Yes, that is the way. And so when she came to the monastery, they, they made this whole ordeal out of it. They just sat there and wouldn't talk to her. She paid respect to them, and they kind of just turned away. I wouldn't talk to her. And she said, what have I done? Have I done anything wrong? And they wouldn't talk to her. They said, what, don't you know? No, there, there was an act, really. They, don't you know the Got this Gotama, he's ruining us. Everyone's falling for his honeyed words, his sweet tongue, you know, his something about him, he's charming them, or so on. And he says, oh, I, she said, I, no, I don't know who that is, but um, can I help? Can I help you in some way? And he said, well, if you wish us well, find a way to cast reproach upon the monk Gotama and put an end to the gain and honor bestowed upon him. Find some way to besmirch his good name. She said, okay, 
I will do that, I will take the responsibility. She seems to have not been a very good person either, so it's reasonable to understand. It's an easy to understand how she got caught up with these losers. She appears to have been a bit of one herself. Uh, and so she undertook to f uh, some kind of subterfuge. What she did was, in the beginning, she would just go and spend the night near the monastery, or she would walk to the monastery when, when everyone was coming back. So every evening the Buddha would give a talk, and in the evening when they were all coming back, a kind of late night perhaps, she would walk towards the monastery and people would ask where are you going and she's in the beginning she said I, I don't I'm not uh, I'm, uh, it's private something like that and you know just something actually to make them suspicious you know you, you tell them don't tell them where you're going and they get even more suspicious and then she would go and sleep somewhere near the monastery where the Buddha was staying and in the morning when the people would come to give food and listen to the Buddha's teaching in the morning she would walk away from the monastery, and they say, where are you coming from? And again, she would say, it's my, my own business. And she did this for like a month. And after a month, she started telling people, when they asked her, she would say, I'm staying with, uh, I'm staying with Gotama, staying in, with him in, the, in his, uh, in his kuti. And unfortunately, as we all know, uh, some not everyone is discerning enough to see the truth of such statements. You know, it's, it's not impossible, it's not even probably all that hard to fool the majority or a good majority of people. You can see this in politics. It's not really to cast aspersions on, on such people, but you know, sometimes you're trying to live your life, you don't have the time to investigate, and you find yourself listening, and especially if you, for people who didn't have a strong knowledge of the Buddhist teaching or a strong sense of the goodness and the rightness of it, for them it, it was quite easy to convince them, or, or at least make them suspicious. It didn't convince them, but they became very suspicious. Then they said to themselves, "Is it true or is it false?" They were, they had doubt, and doubt is, of course, a problematic mind state. And then, after three or four months of that, so this is a real long con, she wrapped her belly up with bandages and went about, you know, so to make her stomach a little bit larger. And she went around saying, oh, I'm pregnant. I, I'm carrying Gotama's child. And again, people became more suspicious and some people lost interest in the Buddha and you know how that goes, right? You, you, our reputation is so easy to lose. It's not entirely true, but it's easy to hurt someone's reputation. It's such a fickle thing. And then after eight or nine months, she put some wood, a big, actually a big uh, half sphere, I guess, or something, in her belly, to, you know, I guess to put some weight and drew a cloak over it and then she beat herself, like pounded her arms and legs to, um, to make, her, make them swell, so she appeared uh, swollen. And then pretending to be tired, she went, went one evening, and this is the climax of the story, went to where the Buddha was teaching, so in front of all the people, the Buddha was there with a hall full of people teaching, and stood before him. And she gave quite a speech. She said, oh, look at this great group of people you've, you've come to teach. You have a sweet voice, soft lips. She actually says that, I guess, you have soft lips. But you're the father of my child, and I'm getting ready to deliver. You know, my time of delivery is soon. In spite of this, you haven't supported me, you make no effort to give me the requirements for yada, 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 so on. And 
She says, you, you know how well enough how to take your pleasure, but you know not how to look after the child you have begotten. Thus did she revile the Buddha. Can you imagine? No? Remember, the, the theme here is lies. Well, as lies go, this is a pretty... I mean, yeah, it's a pretty severe one. I mean, towards the Buddha, for such a great and powerful being, from Buddhist point of view, there's not much worse you can do. And the Buddha stopped teaching, and he looked at her. And what do you think he did? Do you think he denied it? It's interesting, sometimes when you deny it, it makes it worse. But what he said to her, and they say it's like a lion's roar. A lion's roar is just like a speech that is very powerful. And the most powerful speech here, I mean, I think it is quite powerful, is to call upon the truth. And he said to her, he says to her, in regards to this matter, you know the truth and I know the truth. That was his response. And she didn't let up. She says, so who is to decide between what is true and what is false when only you and I know? And then suddenly, I'm skipping a bit a bit here, but we'll say suddenly, through some means or other, fortuitous circumstance, the, uh, the piece of wood slipped and fell on her feet. And the text says it cuts her, cut her feet, her toes off, but I'm going to leave that part out as well. It fell on her feet, and we'll say she got hurt. Suddenly just slipped out. Whoops. Suffice to say, the people listening to the Buddha, again, we're talking about ordinary people, not just the, not only people who are meditation practitioners, enlightened beings, and so on. Some of them were not enlightened by any means. And some of them had perhaps been harboring suspicions, and now they were very angry at being fooled. And so these people got up and chased her out of the monastery, beating her, hitting her, and so on. And the story goes that she went to hell. The story goes the earth opened up underneath her feet and swallowed her whole. But either way, I think it's fair to assume that she did in fact go to hell as a result. That's the story. The Buddha tells a past life story where a similar thing happened. It's an interesting story, but that's for another day. And I encourage you, if you're interested, to read the Jataka stories associated with these. But we're going to get into the lesson. I'm much more interested in what this means to us as meditators and Buddhists. So again, I think there are two, two different lessons. The first one relates, I think that's interesting to us, relates to prosperity. And how remarkable it is that people think, as these wandering recluses thought, that you can become prosperous through evil. That somehow evil deeds, lies in this case, and, and, and worse than lies, malicious lies designed to harm someone, to greatly harm someone. The idea that that could lead to prosperity is quite remarkable. And so it, it, it brings a, a broader question to the fore about prosperity through evil in general. I mean, isn't it true that a person who does an evil deed prospers? It's a trick question, I suppose. But it's, a, it's an argument that's put forward. I mean, well, it's certainly true that a person who steals gains, right? I mean, in the short term, of course, the arguments are, there are other arguments involved, but the 
there's a there's a question of karma because if if a person steals from you, well, you know, I I didn't. Why did they, the the person who did the bad deed, gain, and why do I, the person who never did any bad deed, lose? So the broader picture, of course, would tell us more. But more to the point, I think we have to understand that. Um, we have to ask the question of, of whether st uh, the theft is that which allowed for the, the profit. And so I think, it, I, I want to explain this because I think it's more than that. And this helps us understand karma and it helps us understand maybe things like meditation even. Because to say that the theft is what allowed the person, the thief to pro prosper, is actually missing a lot of the story. Because if you talk about what it takes to steal, take two people. One person is incompetent and the other person is competent. One person is clever, the other person is not clever. So take these two people and ask yourself which one is going to succeed in stealing? Which one is more likely to st succeed more often in stealing? in doing any bad deed, right? Take a weak person and a strong person. Which one is going to succeed in things like torture or, or rape or that sort of thing? So what I'm getting at here is th these are actually all positive qualities, physical and mental qualities that differentiate beings. And putting aside physical qualities, if we just focus on mental qualities. A thief needs things like confidence. So what we're actually talking about is capabilities. And if you want to think of it, karma is kind of, we talk about the karma bank and people wonder whether karma is like a bank that you put money in. In a way it kind of is. As long as we understand what we mean by, by karma and by the bank. But if you think of it as like a system of points, merit and demerit points, what what they really are is abilities or capabilities, right? Like if you if you practice meditation, you become more confident. If you like, there's these books that teach you how to be how to be confident, right? And they'll tell you to recite mantras like "I can do it, I can do it," that sort of thing. And they'll tell you all sorts of things, but you'll find that most often it's a sort of meditation. It's a means of mental development. Uh, if you want to be focused, right? A person who's not focused would make a very bad evildoer because you have to focus on the task at hand and not get distracted and you have to be um, composed or else you'll tell the wrong person and get found out and that sort of thing. And all of these things come from not only meditation but they come actually from good deeds. A person who does lots of good deeds for others is going to become more confident and, and stronger of mind. If you look conversely to what things like theft do for a person, uh, does theft make you more confident and more focused? Does it make you happier? I think it's a question we have to ask because you say, well, the person got what they wanted. They got what they wanted because they had the capabilities. They didn't get it because they stole it, they got it because they were capable, and they were in a position to steal it, and they chose. But the act of stealing, what are the results of that? And because it's, there's, no, there's no question here, from a Buddhist perspective, that the stealing was a bad act, and it will only have bad consequences. So the stealing itself, the consequences for the mind are quite profound. You know, I, I was once tried to teach meditation to a, a thief, a, a guy who was guilty of theft, and, and he, I don't think he ever got caught for it, but he couldn't sit still. He was really in a bad state. His mind was totally unfocused. I always bring up Crime and Punishment, this novel, I think sums it up quite well. If you do very, very evil deeds, there's no escaping them. And of course many other things, of course, you you can get caught and you'll be tortured and punished and so on. And, and, and in, another interesting aspect is you make the world a worse place. 
right? A person who, take a thief. A thief is someone who likes the things of this world, who wants them, who craves them. Not all thieves, but you know, the, the average thief is desperate, so desperate for the things of this world that they will steal them. They will take them uh, against the wishes of others. And so their attachment to this world is certainly going to keep them in this world. And by being a thief, have they made the world a better place? No. A world with thieves, is it better or worse? I think there's no question that it's worse. And even just from the sense of people are less comfortable, they lock their doors, right? I grew up in the, in the middle of nowhere, and we never locked our doors. And we always bragged about it, but I thought often as a kid about that. You know, we would visit the city and they would lock their doors, and we think, wow, people actually lock their doors in places. Never, we didn't have to, you know, the nearest neighbor was a mile away. They didn't lock their doors either. When you start locking your doors and worrying about your kids and, you know, you have to worry about young girls because, for the worst reasons, right? You have to guard your money, guard your bank accounts, guard your internet, guard everything. This is what the world does to us. This is what evil does to the world. And guess who inherits the world? Those people who are desperate enough for it, that they're willing to go to extremes. They're the ones who are sure to be here, or, or even in worse places. That's another topic. So this idea of prosperity, I think it's an interesting lesson for us to think about and to acknowledge that the, there are people and that there is this there is this perversion in the world and even in our minds that we can gain from doing things that are not a source of gain. The second lesson, and so the more to the point one, is about lying. And the Buddha says that lying is, lying is something, is like a gate. It's like a line in the sand. It's a line that, once crossed, it leads to all kinds of evil. The person who is willing to lie. Two things, I guess, that we have to talk about them both. The first one is they've thrown away their future. Vitina paraloka, Vitina paraloka is someone who has thrown away their afterlife. What it means is, any hope for heaven, any hope for prosperity in their next life, they throw it away. It's a pretty harsh one, just from lying. I think one reason for giving this teaching is because it's a probably often um, overlooked. You know, we talk about killing and stealing, those are really bad, right? What about lying? We think, well, you know, it can't be as bad as killing or stealing, right? But karma is an interesting thing. I don't think the Buddha is saying here that it is the worst evil, that lying is the worst thing you could possibly do. But he's saying something interesting, that lying is a line. And it is, it's different from other kinds of evil. If you kill or hurt someone, that's a quite a straightforward act. I mean, it's an act out of anger and, and it's in the person's face. If you steal, it's often, you know, sometimes you can steal, hit someone in the face and take their lunch money, but more often you do it in, in secret. So that's an invasion, and that's, I think, it, in some sense, worse than, than physical violence, because it's deceitful, or not quite the right word, but it's, it's an unknown, it's something you can't face. You know, a person who steals from you, it's just suddenly the thing that you owned was gone. And that can be devastating. It can feel very devastating to people. But neither of these are like a lie in the sense that a lie goes against the truth. A lie is a disregard for the value of the truth, maligning the truth, which from a Buddhist perspective is an important thing in some ways more important than pain or possession. You know, without the truth, 
and and it's not like a person who lies to you can deceive you about the world. I mean, they can if you're young and impressionable, but the the very the idea of a lie and what it represents is very important. And so the idea is that there's this sense that a person who's willing to malign the truth, who who is a distorter of truth, right? And not just a distorter, a denier, a reverser, someone who reverses, who makes truth a true statement, uh, who, who changes what is true into what is false. It's like this, they say it's not like this. This is a, a negation of the truth. It's some kind of special, uh, some kind of special thing because it relates, I mean it's all psychological, the idea is that there's a psychology behind this, that a person who does this is then Un unequipped or is hurting their ability, their psychological, their mental ability, mental capacity to tell the difference between true and false. Right? The, the, the results of lying are cre to create a nebulous or vague or uncertain state of, of, of reality. And so other deeds like killing, no other truths like killing is wrong, stealing is wrong, become suspect, become vague. You know, there, there's not this certainty. You, you can tell because um, when you undertake to practice, never to lie. And again, by lie, we don't mean lies of omission. We don't mean even deception, where you trick someone into thinking something. We mean where you actually say. X is not X, Y is not Y, not Y is Y, that sort of thing. And so being able to see right from wrong becomes problematic. I mean, that's what the Buddha is getting at here. And it's interesting, there, there's no question that there is a line being crossed when you lie. I mean, it's a very powerful practice to never lie. And it makes your mind very strong and very devoted to truth, to reality. So it's a very special kind of evil to lie. Something we shouldn't take for granted. Certainly the Buddha didn't think so. Of course, this story has more to it than just a lie, right? It's a malicious lie. Some lies are, you could argue, you're not going to be, the earth isn't going to swallow you up whole just for lying. So there's no question that this was more than just a lie. It was a devastating, evil, wicked, malicious lie. And there was a lot more involved. It was quite a, quite a workup. She spent months planning and plotting. Could you imagine all the bad karma she was cultivating in her mind? It's like a nine-month meditation. She did a nine-month meditation course on evil. That's what it takes to swallow you up whole, culminating in the, the final act of lying in front of the Buddha and accusing the Buddha of something pretty serious. Not, not, you know, not like he raped her or something, but it's pretty serious for a monk and for a religious teacher to be accused of sleeping with a woman and... and so on. So. Understanding karma, understanding that there is something I mean, very real about good and bad karma, and understanding the nature of, of truth that truth is important, and lies are very bad because of how important the truth is. We're not in Buddhism concerned about belief or even hard work. The only hard work we should be doing is to understand the truth. And so lies are, are very, very bad for that, something we should never engage in. And that's the Dhammapada for tonight. So thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best.